we go through our four panelists that we have today, I'd like to ask each of you if you could please just tell us briefly about your role and a bit about the classes that you are either teaching or taking this term in particular. And if you could say a little something about whether you have had previous experience with online or asynchronous teaching and learning prior to this fall and tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, and I'd like to ask Aaliyah to kick us off. Okay, um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, so I teach in the Department of Ethnic Studies um, and I also am an associate with faculty development. Um, this quarter I am teaching three large sections of Introduction to Race and Ethnicity in the US. Um, so it's a course that a lot of students from across the university take to fulfill the diversity requirement. And it's also a course that um, Ethnic Studies majors and minors will take as a foundational course for, the, for their major. So uh, that's a, it's a big course. I have 90 students this quarter. And I have had, thankfully, thank you to um, academic technology, I've had some experience and training in teaching online and, and teaching um, in an asynchronous format. So I, I typically teach summer courses. And um, because of students logging in from different time zones and also students often having jobs or internships during the day, um, I was able to develop the summer courses, the summer online courses as asynchronous. So I have a little bit of um, background with that work in addition to um, taking the AQ course that's offered through faculty development that really helped me to um, learn some new strategies for teaching online and in an asynchronous format. That's great. Um, and Laura, how about you? Uh, so I just want to first thank Susan for having this event and everybody who worked on this event because I think it's really fabulous. I have students this quarter in uh, four different continents. I don't know how many different time zones. Um, I'm teaching uh, Cultures and Ideas 1, Ideas in a Changing World. So I've got a lot of first-year students. So I was really excited about how to get a really interactive experience for them since it is, you know, their first uh, introduction many of them to college life and I'm also teaching an upper division course uh, tech innovation and culture. I'm an associate professor in the sociology department so I've got lots of different majors but both of the courses are offered in SOCH. As for my previous training, um, I think I was really fortunate because when I was at UCLA uh, many moons ago I was the technology TA coordinator so I got all sorts of training uh, in the early days of teaching with technology. I taught all my courses in a lab um, so I have really enjoyed teaching with technology for a lot of time. Um, but since I was on sabbatical last winter and spring, I just want to give a shout out to all the great faculty who participated uh, this summer and all the training workshops who shared their experiences because it was really the discussions with them that helped me get some really good strategies that I'll share later for this fall. So I want to just thank everybody in our community for sharing all of their insights and the way we can collectively help each other. And again, thank you, Susan, for putting this together. Thanks, Laura. And I think your um, comments are a really good segue to also reiterate that our um, faculty development team and faculty collective with Eileen Elrod, Nancy Cutler, and Chris Bakken are doing a terrific job really pulling together ongoing resources related to you know, pedagogy and um, teaching online. And so um, as always, that is really kind of the, the key resource for ongoing discussions about this as well. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, um, Rohan, how about you? You're on mute, Rohan. Yeah, um, so I already had previous experience for online classes. I'm an undergraduate student for those of you who don't know. So I had to go home in March, which I stayed at my uncle's place for three months and I took online courses, which was pretty much of a surprise because I didn't know how to study online because I had never studied online. I got through that, then I did my summer from home and I've been home ever since. And right now I'm taking three political science classes because my one of my majors is political science and all three of them are synchronous and it's a big headache because I am in a time zone which is 12 and a half hours ahead, which means staying up at night almost uh, three days in a week. And my schedule has pretty much become staying awake in California time and uh, sleeping in Indian time. But it's been going well. I'm getting accustomed to it. I set my schedule. I set my sleeping time. I've been getting my own time, but I wish I could get back. 
on campus. And Jessica. Hi everyone, glad to meet you all. Uh, my name is Jessica Yuan. I am an MBA student graduating in March, 2021. I originally came from Shanghai, China, and now I live in the Bay Area with my family. Um, I have three little kids busy at home and uh, we are all taking online classes now. Um, <laughs> so compared with other newly enrolled students, I am experienced in online cl classes. Our course is transferred to the online version since spring 2021. So uh, yeah, I've already finished the several uh, courses, including merchant acquisition, um, business valuation, a challenge in communication, and database management. So I'm currently having Python class now. And for next quarter, I will take big data and uh, marketing analytics. So it's, it's everywhere, including technical courses, um, also a marketing class and a communication class. So yeah, I will let you know more about how my feel. <laughs> uh, yeah, details, more details coming up with, uh, to you. So thank you so much, Susan and Melissa for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now I'd like to turn again to our panelists. And I, I know you've all been teaching and learning online this term. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit um, about how that has impacted your approach to courses, how you have kind of approached managing and navigating this term. And um, Laura, why don't I ask you to kick us off this time? Great. So um, I really was concerned about students like Rohan who would have to completely disrupt their sleep schedule. So my goal was, okay, I want all readings, materials, and interactive assignments to be potentially asynchronous. At the same time, I know we'd also have a lot of students who would want um, engagement, et cetera. So for those students, the ones who really want and thrive with a real-time interaction in an appropriate time zone, I offer optional weekly Zoom sessions and many live media events. So I'm balancing both students can do everything asynchronously, earn their goal grade, or they can have some live events and also earn their goal grade. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is build things um, my courses so that not only do the students have confidence in what's expected, confidence that they have different roads to success, but also do what I can to allay anxiety as part of our care of the whole person. So for example, to build confidence in our shared experience, I made sure that all readings, all assignments, and very detailed instructions about everything were posted before the first day of class. And I sent an email out, I think it was two weeks before class, a week before class, and the first day of class, saying you know exactly what was there, when I'd be available for Q&A, et cetera. I then had the whole first weekly Zoom devoted entirely to Q&A. I opened a special discussion board on Camino where I constantly answer general questions. And then as questions come in an email, I've told students I'm anonymizing all your questions and I'm sharing them to every member of our classroom community so we all benefit from any question. And I think it's really good for the students because you know, a lot of other people are asking the same question, so let's just answer it for everybody, but let's do it in an asynchronous way. And I promise the students I would not announce anything on the optional Zoom that I wouldn't also archive. So if anything comes up in the Zooms, then I archive it to our general Q&A or I send an email to the class. And what I think this does is it helps the students know that I'm creating transparent alternatives and alternate modes of communication for everything. And so then the students can be really confident knowing that they're gonna get all of the information in at least one format that fits synchronous or asynchronous learning. Um, and so part of, I think, doing this is having these really detailed schedules. I have a very detailed uh, schedule with all dates that I constantly update, uh, discussion prompts, assignment parameters, and I have links to all these media events that I'm doing. Um, and I'm constantly updating and I've told the students, I will date every update so that you know. So all you have to say is, okay, when's the last time I checked this? Okay, here's the new date. I need to do that. Um, and so uh, last week, or I, I think it was last Friday, I sent an email to the students and I said, I really want to know what's working for you and I want to uh, let other faculty and staff know what's working. So I said, you know, here's an optional anonymous way for your voice to be shared. And so here's what they said was working for them. I'm just going to summarize what they said was creating positive learning experiences, not just in my class, but in a couple other classes, but I'll share what I'm doing. So to keep them confident that they understand expectations, they said they like constant expectations with short and long-term goals. So for example, they appreciated that I've created a rhythm of weekly assignments that are graded, but also cumulative long-term assignments that they can work at at their own pace. 
for both of them, they like constant communication. So like I just said, I'm sending the weekly emails I'm, with all of the assignment due dates. Um, I'm sending the announcements on the Caminos page. I'm announcing it in the optional Zoom. Um, I just went through all of my grades, for example, and I saw who was missing grades and those got emails as well. So I'm constantly and very friendly, you know, hey, you know, you might want to check this out, etc. Um, I'm also really committed to providing quick feedback. So as much as possible, especially for the shorter assignments, I'm trying to get grades in by 48 hours. So I'm grading assignments weekly and posting comments to Camino as soon as possible. Um, the students said they really also appreciated the opportunity for self-directed learning, especially if they're juggling different classes or they are in you know, time zones that make it harder. And so what I said is I'm going to offer several pre-grade opportunities so students can admit their, submit their work in advance either remotely through Camino or on a live Zoom session with me. Either way, they can submit their work, especially the first year students, get feedback, know they're on track, and then you know correct and make it better if they need to. And I think that's been very helpful. I've also offered unlimited individual help in pre-grading assignments um, and enhanced assignments such as attending additional media events. So when we had the twin um, pandemics forum and then it was archived, I've said, okay, look, let's just say you missed a discussion post, go watch an archived media event or watch another one live if it was that week do an extra uh, 300 word write up or so. And then, you know, you can enhance your grade that way. And I think for the rocky beginning, some students have the beginning of the term knowing they could improve that later uh, was really helpful. One thing that I am just really excited about was I wanted to replicate the highly interactive format that we have in face-to-face -face learning. So I'm assigning, I'm calling them weekly media events. Um, and so students attended the Twin Pandemics Forum and we've been following the entire speaker series sponsored uh, by the Mercula Center for Applied Ethics and the High Tech Law Institute. It's the Artificial Intelligence for Social Impact and Equity series. Students have been so excited about that. Um, and then they do write-ups on every event and that's worked really well. And so finally, what was really important to me is I, I wanted to exercise both their long and their short-term learning. So we do the weekly discussion post that I'm gonna talk about in the next section, but I've also uh, created a portfolio assignment where they have to give 300 word responses to every reading and 300 word responses to every media event. And then they have to do some cumulative writing. And this is due two times in the term so that their thinking can evolve over time and they can integrate all of the insights from the diverse media events and reading um, in this portfolio Portfolio, and then they can walk away with a fairly large document where they can really be, you know, proud of the way they're synthesizing and understanding some of the most, you know, I would say, transformative developments that we're living through together as a, as, you know, in terms of AI and technology and everything. So I think it's going well. Thank you so much for sharing all your approaches this term. It's really great to hear everything that you've been doing. Um, Jessica, how have you approached your studies this term? Yeah, um, first of all, I would say the impact is very, very huge to me because I am taking the MBA courses and I'm heavily, um, at least half of the MBA courses are based on communication because when for like marketing classes, we have to do like case study. For our communication class, we do presentation, we do um, a pitch as well. So there's no way you can feel the same way you present in front of the audience inside of the classroom face to face versus you speaking to the camera hole on your laptop. It's totally different, right? So um, this is a big challenge for us, how to learn about um, engagement for a real online classes. And um, the, one, the other challenge is time management and the location management, actually, because I have three kids at home, they are doing online classes as well. Um, sometimes when, during the day, we have like a webinar um, for me to join and then a um, project meeting um, with my cohort. And I, my, my kids, they are having their online classes as well. So how can I have every single person with a private room to have their meeting? It's impossible. So now, uh, to be honest with you, I have a virtual background. If I take this off, you will see I'm currently uh, sitting in front of my bathroom in the, in the, in the <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a master bedroom. So you, you always try to find a way to how to uh, manage, a, like keep your life balanced. So my kids, they have their online uh, classes in a very comfortable area. That's my top priority. For me, I will set myself every single corner as long as a 
quiet place, even in a closet. So I'm totally confident with that. Yeah, so uh, that's part of the solution, actually, I want to um, like share with uh, the audience today. And also, the other thing is communication. Um, when, when I have a classes, simply listen, enjoying, that's okay. But if I have presentation, I definitely want them, hey, mommy is in presentation today, don't Come in, don't don't wave your hands, whatever show in the background. And they will say, oh, mommy, you're doing makeup. Definitely you're doing presentation today. Yes, you're so smart. So just keep your family members um, on the same page with you. So I think that's going to be really helpful. And then some of the uh, students, they cannot join in the same time zone. And then their family member, they are sleeping or or uh, they are busy in cooking, whatever. Let them know if you are present today, trying to uh, keep that moment time window open, quiet, and give you the chance to fully engage. I think that will be helpful. Thank you. That's great advice. Thank you. Rohan, how have you been managing your experience this fall specifically? Um, I think Jessica pretty much summed up my experience because one of our majors is communication and imagine taking public speaking online, giving a speech in front of an audience that is on my screen, dressing up and holding a glass in your hand and giving a speech, which was the weirdest thing I've done <clears throat> in my life. I took public speaking and other communication classes, which, are, which was so difficult because speaking in front of an audience sitting in front of you is much and much, much easier than focusing on a camera, camera dot that's right above your PC. Otherwise, I, had, I uh, recently took uh, I, uh, course in political science, which was European Union, and we had these cabinet meetings and imagine having, having a cabinet meeting online. It's been really tough, but I have been trying to get through it, keeping my calm. And I think now I'm getting used to it. Maybe this quarter, will, the next quarter is going to be much, much better than what I've been experiencing. But I, what I would say to everyone is just keep your calm. You'll get through it and follow along. Thank you. And Aliyah. Share with us, please, how you've been managing this term. I, I loved hearing everybody's insight too. And, and I think that I connect with so much of what's already been said. Um, I think for me, I employed four kind of major strategies uh, this, this quarter when I had time after spring to really revisit my courses and to think about them. And I think three are really doable for everybody, regardless of what class they're teaching. And, and one is kind of specific to the situation I found myself in this, in this quarter. But um, the first one speaks to something Laura already mentioned, which is making sure that all content is available for the entire quarter from day one. And it really clearly outlined um, for students on Camino. So that was, that was one strategy. Um, I did something a little bit different that's just a small language shift, but instead of calling office hours office hours, I, I started calling them student hours. And every week with that course content, um, I have weekly student office hours that students can sign up for and they can sign up for, you know, in advance um, if they, um, if they want to meet during, you know, if, if during week one, they knew ahead of time that they wanted to meet during week three, that that was something. And I found that changing that, the name from office hours to student hours has shifted how many people show up that, you know, in spring quarter, um, very few students showed up during office hours. And I found that the shift to calling it student hours and um, having the sign up available for students in advance. Now, every week I have students filling all of the slots that are available. The third thing that I did was create something called learning communities, um, which is something that I do in my face-to-face -face classes. I've been doing it for about two years now, uh, but I found that in the asynchronous type of course, it's really, really helpful. So um, I place students in small groups of usually four to five um, with consideration of their time zone um, and also their major. Is something that I try to think about um, is to think about what commonalities can I find with the students um, and place them in small groups that I assign. Um, sometimes in face-to-face -face courses, I'll let the students select the group, but because we're online and I'm assuming that um, not only are many of the students kind of meeting for the first time, but it's really hard to just like turn to the person next to you and say, do you want to be in my group, right? So I assign the, the learning communities and 
Um, while the entire class is asynchronous, the students meet with their learning communities uh, every week and they have a weekly assignment that they um, will record a discussion that they'll have amongst themselves and it'll be a short discussion um, about the material or sometimes I'll give a prompt during the election week. Um, it was really just a reflection and check in space for them to use. Uh, but I find that students, even in an in asynchronous class, still want some sort of connection. And so the learning communities allow for that connection, but it manages it in a way that um, students can decide when they're going to meet on their own, on their own schedule. So it doesn't have to be whatever assigned class time we had. Um, and that way it really accommodates the students who are in different time zones. Um, and gives them really kind of the ownership over when they're meeting and, and how they're scheduling. The fourth strategy that I employed, and this was really with the help of academic technology, was um, because I was teaching three sections of the same course, I combined all of my sections. So instead of three sections and three community classes of 30 each, I combined them to one um, so that I had one Camino class with 90 students. And this made my life easier because it meant that when I was making changes on my Camino courses, I only had to do it once for everybody. But it also made it easier for the students because now out of 90 students, I was able to connect um, the students who were logging in from China and Japan and Indonesia, for example, who originally were in different sections and wouldn't have had the ease with which to connect with their peers um, across time zones, uh, I was able to sort of connect them as well. So that was kind of a trick that worked out for me this quarter. And it also was because I had three sections of the same course. So I know that that won't always happen for um, faculty teaching different courses, um, but those were, those were the four. So uh, making sure that all the content's available from day one, having weekly student hours and calling it student hours so that it's approachable and the students know that the time is for them, um, creating learning communities or small groups so that the students feel um, that they have connection in the class, and then lastly, combining all the sections. Those are great. I love your idea of just sort of the simple nomenclature change to student hours. And I, you know, I hear feedback frequently about these small kind of changes that really make an impact in how people are able to understand how they might engage or sort of feel comfortable engaging. Um, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to turn now to um, a, a delve a little bit more deeply with, with some of the terrific strategies that Aaliyah and Laura have already shared. Um, and also want to note the question in the chat that Andrea has posted um, <clears throat> in the challenge providing opportunities to engage with peers when students are six or more time zones away. And so for both um, Laura and Aaliyah, I wanted to ask you specifically if you could um, share any other strategies that you have used that are successful beyond what you've already shared. Um, and also what challenges you've experienced along the way, sort of where have you tried something and felt that mm, wasn't quite exactly what I was hoping to achieve and then how did you adjust along the way and what other advice you might have for faculty teaching asynchronous courses in particular and if you can um, manage to address Andrea's question along the way that would be terrific as well um, and why don't we go to Laura then. Great um, so one of the challenges that I think I really had at the beginning was the students, and frankly, many members of our campus community were approaching online learning. It's like, well, we just got to get through this and then it's going to go back to normal. And I said, no, let's not do that. I want us to see this as actually building all of your life skills. And then I told them my sister-in-law, her work has gone completely remote. I spoke to other alums from Santa Clara, former students in my classes this summer. They're completely remote if they want to the rest of their lives. And I said, we need to see this as an opportunity to build the new normal. And so I'm trying to present my teaching as you're actually learning a battery of skills and communication skills they're going to be key to your success in the new landscape of work. And I'm sure we all want to get back to face-to-face -to -face as soon as possible. But you know what? We need to learn how to do this really well. So let's make this a way that we can do something really good together and think of it as building something rather than kind of making up for something that's not so great. I said, no, no, no. Let's, let's take this as far as we can go and learn from each other. And that's one reason I gave the you know, option to my students to say, okay, let's get some feedback. So at the beginning of the quarter, you know, I sent out 
something is, you know, I want to make sure everybody's needs are met. So share your concerns with me. And again, it was many of the students who are in so many different time zones. And they said, you know, I'm really concerned about the opportunity to engage. Um, and they said other students, I like to use the term classroom colleagues. Um, and then I had other students who said, I am so overwhelmed. I just need to know everything that I'm doing. I don't necessarily want to be locked into Zooms that I might not want to do. And that's why I took your class because I really wanted to know that everything would be asynchronous. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I need to meet all of these different uh, needs at the same time, those who want complete asynchronous learning for whatever reason. And some of them said, I need to do all the assignments in advance because that will make me less anxious and I will know that I'm in control of my learning experience. So I had to provide that. And then I had a whole bunch of other students who are like, you know, I really need the weekly engagement. So I'm like, okay. So on top of the optional Zooms, I created what I call an interactive. Um, and I created this so that students would not feel left out and they would get as much of that engagement as possible. And one thing that I think was really important was explaining everything to the students, saying, this is what's happening. Here are the constituents, the concerns from different student constituencies. And I made all of my reasoning very transparent and invited their feedback. So, and I've actually had students say, okay, I know we're doing it this way to meet these needs, but you know, and they've actually referenced that. And I think it's generated a lot of empathy for one another. And so I think that's been really good. So this idea is the two-part interactive. And the students get to decide every week if it's going to be synchronous or asynchronous. They're not locked into a decision. It's a weekly what's best for them thing. And the first part is they do an interactive assignment on Camino. And this is a hundred word uh, response to the readings and media of the week, along with any thoughts that they're having. This is a hundred words on a threaded classroom discussion. So they're all writing to one another. And it's gone really well because for those students who again need the totally synchronous, they have a seven day period um, to do this. And in fact, some of them have gone weeks ahead and done it. Uh, the ones that really wanted that totally synchronous experience. But the part that I think is really cool is the interactive part of the assignment. And this is where they're really engaging with uh, one another. So every week they either can come to the Zoom and interact or they are allowed to respond to two of their classroom colleagues on that same threaded discussion. Um, and they're required to do at least 50 words to at least two different colleagues for another 100 words total. So that's 200 words total. And I have to say it's been kind of a treat to see what they're doing. And um, I made it a requirement that it had to be positive reinforcements, so that we were not going to get into any negative things. It doesn't mean we can't you know, pose questions to each other, challenge assumptions. Um, but I, I did make it a requirement that it has to be positive engagement and positive interaction. And I think what that really translates to is respect. And I said straight out, I said, as a society, you know, we need to learn how to engage with one another in mediated settings with respect. Um, and I think it really has created a respectful atmosphere that's uh, normative. And so I'm going to take advantage, if you don't mind, to do a quick screen share for you guys. And I'm just going to show you an example from week three and how quickly students were actually able to do this. So you can see um, here's the uh, initiating post by student Pat, who discussed, um, you know, that student's uh, views on AI. And this is when we're getting into these great live events. And then you can see you have five different responses to student Pat. These are anonymized, clearly. And um, I, I notice, I would like you to notice this purple text where they're questioning Pat, but in a positive, respectful manner. Um, and so I think not only does this help them engage with one another, trade ideas, but it's also teaching, I think, a very important lesson than that, that a civil discourse is not dead and we can recreate it in our classrooms. So I love this. And um, if anybody else has any other experiences that, you know, can help me build more things like this, I would love to hear them. So thank you. That's a great example. Thank you so much for sharing, Laura. Um, Aliyah, what other um, strategies or advice or examples of when things didn't quite go the way you wanted and how you addressed it might you be able to share? For sure. Um, I really am thinking too of what Rohan said at the beginning about remaining calm. Is that just being a main theme for, for the time right now? Um, and I appreciated what Laura, Laura said about thinking through not just um, the shift to online as like this urgent um, shift that we're doing in a crisis, but really taking this opportunity to rethink some of our pedagogy uh, long term and think about the choices that we're making. Uh, so 
one of the things I, I spoke a little bit about the student hours already, but one something that I did was every week I changed the time from either morning till um, late afternoon. So that could accommodate student schedules as well. Um, and then reminded students that if they weren't able to make any of those times that we could set up a different schedule or set up a different appointment. Um, in terms of Andrea's specific question about, how, you know, how do I provide students opportunities to engage with each other who are in six or more time zones away? If it's possible, I would try to um, place the students like I do with the learning communities in small groups according to their time zones. That's one option if you have enough students from each time zone to make up small groups of two to three students. Um, if that's not possible, something that I've also done in the summer uh, when I've taught online is that I have students record audio or video posting messages for their, their small groups or their peers. So it's kind of a remix on the discussion post rather than having it be written. It's something where they can hear or see each other potentially. And I think that that um, really helps with student engagement. What was especially neat for me teaching those online asynchronous courses and watching the videos that the students would post is then running into them on campus um, later and feeling like I know you, I recognize you, right? And have, kind of having that moment with a student, which is great. Um, so that's something that I would really recommend um, doing. You can do that through the discussion feature on Camino. And so you can have it be, um, you know, kind of a public discussion post where everybody in the class uh, sees what's been posted, but um, students are placed in groups where they know who they have to respond to or who they are responsible for. And again, I really like the idea of maintaining small groups throughout the 10 weeks because I really think they get to know each other and they get to have these deeper conversations with each other because they kind of build this trust with, with each other over the course of the quarter. So that's one of the things that I uh, would, would recommend as a way to, to build in student engagement. Um, a, a challenge that I faced this quarter uh, has really been around um, seeking out the students who are struggling. Um, when students aren't logging into Camino um, or are not responding to email, you know, I think when we were on campus, we felt like we could find the students somehow, or like maybe they would come to class and maybe we could talk to them after class and, and directly see what they needed and how we could best serve them. Um, so that has been a real challenge. And I think, you know, all things considered with uh, the pandemic and also the racial uprising that's going on and just the amount of stress that students are experiencing, I would say that there's a larger percentage of students who have kind of just like stopped logging in than I would, nor than I would typically have um, in a face-to-face -face quarter. That being said, I think there's a ton of really great resources, primarily the Drawman Center um, has been really spectacular in helping me connect with students. Um, I've also worked with Erin Kamora Walsh in LEAD um, to strategize like how to best serve student needs um, if, if, if there's something going on that we can do as a community to help the students. Um, so th that I think has been kind of the, the primary challenge. Um, of course, I really appreciated that Jessica mentioned um, family as being a priority, and that's something I really try to model for my students. I am a, a mother of a four-year-old who my students have all met. You might meet him later <laughs> in this hour as well. Um, but modeling for my students that their well-being and um, their, their mental health um, and their family is, is the top priority. And so making sure that they know that um, that's something that I uh, want to support them with as well. That's great. I, it's such a, a different kind of new normal, isn't it? That our, our spouses and our kids and our pets are part of all kinds of meetings and we never know what will happen. And you may meet my dog later today as well. So um, uh, thanks for those great suggestions. And I do think, you know, we keep hearing um, over and over sort of the um, the ongoing stress, you know, pandemic is clearly a marathon, not a sprint. And so sort of the way that we're managing this can feel really different for people on an individual basis from week one to week two. And it can have to do with an election or it can have to do with, you know, a, a personal um, situation going on with your family. And I think 
it, there's just not the same um, kind of capaciousness in our experience now to sort of absorb those things differently. We're kind of living all of these things together. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate the sensitivity that um, you're, you're sharing and approaching that and, and Jessica, you sharing also kind of your strategies for really managing it because it really is the reality, right? Um, and I think it's really valuable to kind of keep that at the forefront when, when we're thinking about how do we how do we deal with this. Um, I want to um, remind everyone that we will have time for Q&A. So if you have questions or if you have great ideas that you'd like to share, please put those in the chat um, as we are continuing the session and we'll get to those at the end. But this is a great time to, put, to make sure to get those into the chat now. I want to... Um, uh, move toward another question for all of our panelists. And then I think we'll have time to go into the Q and A after that. Um, and so, um, what, as we near the end of fall term, I know it's hard to believe, and, and we're sort of looking ahead to, um, winter term and beyond and, you know, the extent to which we can plan uh, for in-person classes, you know, in the spring, it, it, it's still in flux. What are you preparing for right now? What's on your mind? How are you kind of um, approaching this at this moment as we start to look forward? And why don't we start um, with uh, Jessica? Sure, um, I can share with you from two different perspectives. First of all, as a student, um, I, will say, I will say like a review, the class recording is really, really helpful. For me, uh, I'm taking the Python class. It's a big challenge to me. I've never done any coding before. I'm a finance person, marketing person, but I'm definitely not an engineer. So uh, simply because of the, the concentration, currently I'm on a business analytics concentration. I have to take the Python well, in the sequel. And I have to, you know, I'm 30, so almost 39 years old. I have to learn the new world of the, the set, whole skill set. It's a big challenge to me. So even I don't have the time zone um, issue, but still I felt really challenging um, inside of the class setting. So I have to go, go over the class recording again, sometimes pause and think about it and practice and then and see if I can do the same. Um, you know, turnouts based on the coding as professor show inside of the class. So I think it's definitely helpful um, for international students who engage outside of the uh, time zone, right? And the second thing is the mentally prepared. Um, I feel like you will be kind of lazy if you stay at home, sitting in front of computer, sometimes in pajama, sometimes you're eating and drinking. Your, your life is, is chill. But class setting, you have to respect. This is a class. You're studying. You're learning. You're 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 trying to add a new value to your brain. So, um, I, I would recommend students to dress up a little bit, not like professional dress up, but definitely don't just so relaxed as a pajama, like totally on sofa, sit in front of computer, like still, right? I think that will help you to get engaged. Um, also, uh, I would I would like to say networking really helps. Um, for you to get engaged um, because you know before that we are every single a single day when we go to school we meet every single person in Lucas Hall we say hello we have a lot of small talks before the class right even after class we only have 10 minutes transition we will say hey how's it going and then it's I really love the, enjoy the beautiful moments when we have the real time inside of the class classroom but right now it's so cold every single person is on is so lonely but how can you get engaged one of the way is join the webinar um we have so many webinars so many students activities uh, you don't have to you know speak up during the presentation or whatever just listen listen the way they um, they present, they listen to the stories they share with you. So some of those stories can be very helpful for you to art articulate your own story if you have an um, interview, your behavioral question, how they solve their time conflict, how they, tell me about a time that you uh, manage your life uh, challenges, right? How can you face your failure? So you learn from the audience, learn from the speakers, from webinars, um, from club meetings, from like your team cohort for project management. That will be really helpful. So that's from one perspective of students. Um, the other way is for teaching. I can share with you three best practice I 
um, personally felt it's it's very helpful. One is the merger and acquisition class, and then they invite guest speakers from the industry, um, the SVP from the company, and uh, like director of uh, acquisition team. And then every time they come here, I feel like the audience is very exciting because they bring something new to the class, right? And another way is um, the uh, breakout rooms. So when we have the breakout rooms, we engaged with a long period of time and then uh, we can talk to the classmates and sometimes you get a surprise. So I, I really like the breakout room setting. Um, the other one is the office hour. Um, one of the professor for a business valuation, um, he set up like a, a one hour office hour um, every single Monday and sometimes I'll, uh, I'll schedule appointments for each Saturday. So if you have any questions, you feel not comfortable to speak up during a class, classroom setting, you can always reach out to the professor and they will definitely help you out. So that's, sorry, maybe it's a little bit long, but yeah, hope that helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So I, I it's great um, advice to learn from listening to others and, and kind of watching how other people um, present or participate as well. It's great. Thank you. Um, Aliyah, how about you? Uh, and this is um, in terms of what's on my mind or as I'm thinking. Yeah. So as you're, as you know, at this point in fall, kind of, you know, things are still a little bit in flux in terms of planning for winter. So kind of what are you preparing for right now? What's sort of on your mind? And I'll say too, you know, all of, all of our work in the, in the classroom is taking place under the backdrop of, you know, huge public health concerns, uh, concerns about racial equity and social justice in, you know, we're talking about immigration Mm -hmm. every day, all day long. Um, so there's this sort of backdrop of kind of what's happening right now. And I'm just would love to hear any strategies about how you're kind of thinking about that and planning for it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm really, um, I think I, like many people right now, um, am really worried about a lot of things, right? Like I'm really worried about um, just how uh, we are all, broadly kind of coping with or thinking about and feeling like the grief and the loss, this enormous unimaginable grief and loss that that is being experienced broadly. Like that's something that is, is on my mind continually something, um, you know, also on my mind always is the impact of, of the uprising in response to racial injustice and police violence violence that's occurring and the impact that has um, on our students seeing that kind of play out right now. Um, and as somebody who teaches directly on um, race and ethnicity in the U.S., like I think a lot about how um, part of my identity as an educator is really to be steeped in this sort of radical hope. So as I'm thinking about it, I'm really thinking about something that's come out of being online and having students be at home is that students are reading things with their parents or watching things with their parents uh, and having critical discussions with their family members that they otherwise didn't have before. Um, and I think that that gives me this sort of kind of radical hope in some ways that there's there are shifts happening and conversations that might otherwise um, not happen. Um, and so that's kind of what's on my mind, more broadly thinking about the class. Um, and what it looks like, I've really been trying to reimagine assignments and think about like, what are alternatives for them? Like, why do they look this way? Or what are other ways for assignments to look? And that really connects to, I think something Laura said earlier about like telling students about the rationale behind every assignment or explaining to students with clarity. That's something as I'm looking ahead to winter quarter, I'm thinking about you know, how am I explaining the choices I'm making as an educator to my students so that they, um, so that it serves them in the best way possible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and kind of Rohan, Rohan, what's on your mind right now? How are you sort of thinking about kind of this particular moment that we're in as we're heading toward the end of fall quarter and kind of looking ahead and everything that's going on in the world? Um, I'd say besides besides studies, like there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on in the world, and there's a lot of distractions as well. So as studies go on, but there's a lot of things on my mind. So I still don't know whether I'll be back for winter quarter, and still that's still lingering in my mind whether I should whether I should come back or should I not come back, stay with my family, 
or stay, come back and enjoy my time at, on campus. I think when I was on campus, I, I didn't think of so many other things. I just used to focus on studies and my life at SCU. But since I'm back home, there's a lot more things to worry about, which puts me off my schedule. And that's one reason I, I am not enjoying this scenario too much of online studying. But I think I'm getting along and things are working out. That's what I, that's what I would say. Great. And, and I'll, I'll ask Laura, do you have anything to add sort of at this particular moment as you're kind of navigating things and looking, starting to look ahead, what, uh, how you're, what's on your mind? Absolutely. And I think this is a public health crisis and it's one that I think we may continue to live. They said this may just be the first of many such things. This may be the new normal. And so digital inequality, and that does track with socioeconomic status, class differences, race, racial and ethnic um, disadvantages and inequities in our society that tracks with digital inequality. And we need to have easily accessible remote learning to continue to make this year a successful academic experience for both our far-flung students around the world, but also those who may not have equitable access to technologies. Um, so I've studied digital inequality for a long time now, and um, I'm pretty keenly aware of the disadvantage that occurs from unequal access to what I would call the three layers of digital technology. And I think as a campus, we're also, our awareness of this is growing. Um, and the first one is to have good education, whether you're on campus or remotely. And I have had students in my classes at Santa Clara who don't have the internet at home, commuting students particularly. Um, and I've also had students this term who don't have quality digital devices at home. But number one, you have to have basic access to digital devices. We also have to have access to high quality broadband that is reliable and on demand 24 seven. But third, and this is the, the can be the trickier part, is we also have to make sure that everybody has the digital skills to use these tools effectively. And so this year it's taught me something that I would actually add to this and I would call it technological ease. And I think this actually needs to be something that those of us who study digital inequality probe more deeply. And this is that students need to feel at ease with technology so they can do the best work possible. Just this fall, I was absolutely surprised at how many students emailed me or came to the Zoom and said, I don't have office on my device. Or they said, I have no idea how to create, to download a Word doc from Google Docs and send that to you via Camino. Um, so I immediately went to IT and got solutions, um, posted how students can get you know, the free access to the Office Suite. I created many tutorials on how to get docs from Google Suites. But in the future, I'm definitely gonna be putting these things front and center in my syllabi and highlighting them the first day of class and on the Q&A. And I'm also going to have a poll the first week of class to see what people are comfortable with and again to continually tell people about the resources that are available on campus. And I want to make sure that I'm not sharing this just for the students in my class, but also so that they can use it in all of their classes and in future quarters as well. Because I think although we're doing just we're just the tip of the iceberg in what we can do with media. I want to be sensitive to students having technological ease. And the other thing I really want to be sensitive about are privacy issues. And I want to find ways that students can be on camera, but have their privacy respected. And it's not just on Santa Clara. I mean, there, there was a piece in the New York Times last spring about this. Um, so I want to create digital ease for my students, respect their privacy, and also validate you know, their experiences going forward. So I'm super happy to hear from Aaliyah that the video discussions are going well. And I'm, I am going to try this probably next quarter, and I'm going to make sure they have the tools to do it and have the ease to do it as well. So um, I'm looking forward to trying these new things, and thank you for bringing those up. Great. Thanks, everyone. I wanted to just note that um, we did not receive any more questions in the chat or um, words of wisdom, but we're always happy to receive those via email at any time following the session. If anybody wants to follow up, I'll put my email in the, in the chat. Um, as we just are going to wrap up in the next kind of three minutes here, I wanted to pose one last question to each of our four panelists. So just kind of lightning round, if you could 
um, kind of wrap us up here by sharing a top tip or a couple of words of encouragement for um, faculty colleagues or student colleagues who want to maintain a positive experience teaching and learning across time differences and open lines of communication between faculty and students. And um, Rohan, let's have you kick us off, please. I'd say what they say on an airplane, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Because this is gonna be this is gonna be here for a while. And I don't think we're getting out of this soon. So maybe just stag along with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And Laura. So I think in all things we communicate our attitudes to our students and all the little things that we do. So I think we need to have an internal dialogue with ourselves and our own attitude towards online or remote teaching and be positive about it and its potential because this will enhance our students' reception of it and experience with it. If we model, model looking you know, at the best of it and practicing gratitude for the good parts of it. Great, and um, Jessica. What's yeah, I agree with that? Rohan, uh, Lara and Alia. So my advice is don't wait. Because sometimes we say, oh, after the world come back to normal and let's get connected. Don't wait. There's no normal such thing. The hybrid version of work and study, that's the new norm. So you have to get yourself adjust to the new situation as soon as possible. So stay proactive and looking for the solution right now. Thank you. Okay. And Aliyah. Yeah, so I would say, um, particularly for um, faculty, to truly commit to being flexible and compassionate, to, to really do that work, um, and um, to try to be as approachable to our students as possible, because um, our students are dealing with high levels of stress um, and anxiety and loss and grief. And you know, our role is to really support their success in the classroom. And so it means that we really need to be flexible and compassionate and um, commit to that. And then lastly, I'll just say, there's so many resources available for all of us, for faculty, staff, and students. Um, I'm thinking about academic technology who've really made this all possible. Thank you to them. And um, Drawman, Office of Student Life, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Office of Multicultural Learning, and um, the Faculty Collaborative, um, has been really outstanding as well. So there's lots of resources. Um, and if there's any faculty that have questions, I'm happy to connect and, and share my experiences as well. Great. Um well, thanks everyone so much for spending this time with us. I want to hugely thank our panelists, Aliyah Griffin, Laura Robertson, Rohan Metta, and Jessica Yuan.